Hi, Eric. Hey, Aaron. How's it going? I'm fantastic. Um, let's see. We are on episode eight of the season. It's a big number. It's a nice number. Ocho. Um, we have uh, been working our way through this article, this uh, magazine issue. Yes, of BYU Studies about open questions in Latter-day Saint theology. I have to say, this has been a super, super fun time. Yeah. we Who did we get this recommendation Our from? Our bishop. Our bishop, yep. Always listen to your priesthood leaders. Yeah, that's right. And, he, <laughs> and um, it, boy, it's just been fantastic. Um, but we're kind of nearing the end of the year, right? Yes, yeah, so we've got a few left. We, we typically do the show in seasons, mm-hmm. and, you know, we do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> so we typically take a little break over the summer. So for today, we're actually going to do is we're going to double up. We're doubling up. Yeah. We're going to do a couple of them. We're going to do two We may not end up today. doing all of them. We're saving one for the summer in hopes we can do it with the author of the article. We'll see if that works out. Yep. But, and then we, so and we there have may be a couple, couple we don't get to. That's okay. Yeah. It's, it's totally fine. Yeah, it's totally fine. So let's just let's just state the articles up front. Okay. okay. The first one is one that I've just always loved as a topic. Okay. Okay. Just from my own gospel studies. It is understanding the relationship between grace and works. Yes. Okay. This is like fundamental Christian theology. Yeah. And, and um fundamental uh, Fundamental uh, disagreements. Oh, it's so shouty sometimes. <laughs> yes. So I'm very excited about it. This one's it. by Terrell L. Givens. Terrell L. Givens, who I think... We've, we've talked about before. Yeah. Tell me it's, a bit about Terrell It's Givens. hard to talk about Mormon stuff in 2023 without bumping into Terrell every once in a while. Okay. He's written some great books, like um, one about what makes Mormons weird, and one about the writing of the Book of Mormon, and uh, he's written a couple with his wife that have been very popular. Um about the weeping God and the crucible of doubt. And he's got a lot of books out there. He's started some, or been involved in the starting of various Mormon studies programs and busy guy. Okay. And then the other article is called On the Foreknowledge of God, Time, Knowledge, Reality, and Agency. Right? Yes. And this is like the other pendulum in terms of, like, if it's just grace and works, that's going to be a hard topic, right? And this other one, this one seems like that squared. Am I, right. Am I yeah. Wrong so, about in that? both of these, one thing that these two articles have in common is that we are going to be bumping at high speed into some traditional Protestant and Catholic theology. I don't know how much we'll really dig into that, but um, we're going to be super Mormon. And um, and the thing is, the questions, like the very the very terms we're using to discuss this, sometimes just like we're speaking different languages mm-hmm. when evangelicals get annoyed at Mormons for saying, no, we're not talking about the same thing. This, they're right when it comes to these things. Yeah. We have fundamental disagreements on the very definitions of words sometimes. Which is which is super fun. Okay, so Rosalind F. Welch wrote the second yes, article. Yes, do you know her? Um, she has a Berkeley Ward connection. Oh, go on. Um, her brother and sister-in-law and their children used to be in her ward. They were scientists. Uh, she, He was a scientist. She is a creative writer, just got her MFA. Um, so That's fantastic. This second article is also, um, I really loved the dense academic style of it. There, yes. It, I would say that it was the heaviest lift in terms of academic reading we've done so far. Or at least I've gotten over the other ones if yeah. something was competitive. This yeah. was heavy stuff. It was good. All right, let me tell Messianicity. you. Messianicity. Messianicity. So is, is... We're, we've been making note of words that we haven't heard before. And that's <laughs> one I have not heard before is Messianicity, which I assume I'm saying correctly, but who knows? Oh, man. Okay. let's. So we're going to start with the grace and works okay. topic. Let me tell you or try to tell you why this has always been really interesting All right, good to luck. me. And it has to go back to when I was in high school or on my mission or shortly after my mission. And one of the books cited here... Um, I either read or heard about a lot, and it's called Grace Works. Okay, so this is in the tipping the tipping toward grace section of the article. Okay, okay. so I should say what the article does is it argues between grace and works. Are we saved by grace and works? Okay, that's the fundamental, uh, that's the stupid, oversimplified, the oversimplified yes. way to describe the problem, right? Yeah. And so tipping towards grace. Okay. There's this. There was this sequence of books that kind of was published in the 90s, maybe through the 2000s. I haven't looked it up exactly. And one of them was called Grace Works. And it was such a great title because it was all Very about fancy. kind of um, 
adding grace back to the Mormon lexicon. Yeah, this is part of a trend, like Stephen Robinson's book, Believe in Christ, that came out around the same time, which had some similar ideas. Or so, Believing Christ, is that what it was called? Fantastic. It was called something like that. And it was it was in the same genre of re, reclaiming grace for Latter-day Saints. I'm, something about this whole topic just kind of caught my attention, and I was really interested in it. Yeah. Um, around that time, I did a lot of reading, you know, and I was, you know, sir, you know, I did my mission. I really wanted to understand the technical theology, right? Yeah. The mechanism to use the, it. the scientific. Yeah. The formulas of the of the atonement, the mathematics of eternity. How does how does how do you atone for a sin? Right, right. It's, it's such an abstract set of words. Yeah. Right. Then I wanted to really understand it because I believed in it and I wanted to apply it in my own life. Right. I wanted to follow Christ. I wanted to do these things. Didn't really understand what it meant in the brain that I have rejected the idea that you just work would worry about it later yeah I mean, it does work you don't have to understand the atonement to be benefited by it right but the but this this philosophy this conflict in philosophy between grace and works well you know, also, i found that interesting and i wanted to know more yeah and growing up in the era we did as american latter-day saints in wards where i assume this is true of every ward you and i were ever in over half the ward was pioneer stock. Yeah. Um, part of the tradition that we inherited was um, a lot of concern about sin. Maybe not to the sense of like the Puritans and Jonathan Edwards or something like that, but um, we were concerned about repentance, right? Repentance was the great task, and like all our, we had to feel bad about all our sins, and therefore this question of grace and works was a really big one because we had guilt to work through. Yeah. Should we? attempt to take some stabs at some of these terms or do you want to <clears throat> quote here from the from the manual at all or um so manual I'll, from the can article? i I'll, I'll share a couple things okay um, so i'm going to quote givens here sometimes he's quoting other people maybe not uh maybe not um so martin luther did it so when paul said uh, quoting givens when paul said the just shall live by faith luther did not take this to mean that the righteous should live by confidence in christ's promises Rather, given the fact that the object of that faith is certain and steadfast being Jesus Christ himself, his reliability is of such perfection as to ground incontestably the confidence we repose in him. None of what you just said made sense. No, like this This is and the wild were, thing. You were directly quoting Paul. Uh, I started by quoting Paul, and, yeah. then I, and then I got into Given's paraphrase of what Luther is concerned with. So... Um, Later on, sorry, so, to, sorry to be like a bit like. No, no, I totally agree. <laughs> um, it's I, I've had a couple of conversations where people don't understand the latter saint, latter day saint ideas of atonement. I'm like, it seems really easy, but then I try to understand what Martin Luther's ideas. I'm like, I, whoa, huh? okay. So essentially, Givens goes on to say that in the Lutheran idea, when we are judged, the way the atonement works is we're not judged at all. Jesus is judged instead of us. And so his righteousness is substituted for our wickedness, and that is how we are saved. Okay, that actually makes sense to me. There's some logic to it. Okay, so yeah. let's focus on this. Let's first state the LDS perspective, or at least the LDS perspective that I understood as a kid. All right, give it to me. Okay, which is um, salvation after all you can do. I've heard that a million times. Okay, let's just, 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 just define that. Phrase. It comes from Second Nephi. We believe um, we are saved by grace after all that we can do. It does come from Second Nephi, and it's quoted here in the manual. By great, uh, this is Nephi's words: "By grace that we are saved after all we can do." Okay, and here's how I always thought that I would understand it. Right? Yeah. So I need to, if I learn commandments, which yeah. is a big if. Okay, it has to do with not being judged based on things you don't know. Yeah. Okay. So if I learn commandments and I feel that those commandments are true and I obey those commandments, right? That's yeah. what's expected, right? And even if I do all that, it won't be enough. I'll still need to be forgiven of my sins. And that's the grace part of it, right? Yeah. But I need to exercise my own agency to seek after knowing what is right and wrong yeah and then doing what is right right that is a critical component of my salvation yeah 
as is grace, right? So it kind of is this under this holistic understanding of both concepts, where um, and this I I would argue that this is if I surveyed Latter Day Saints, yeah, this is what they would describe grace versus works as. Like, how do you reconcile those two? Terms? Yeah, I think that's probably true because i'm certain it's true of our generation at least of american mormons uh-huh. um and we're the ones teaching the kids yeah so i think it's what they're likely to parrot okay so this is kind of like the parable of the bicycle right you have this is this is stephen robinson okay. where you put enough money to buy a bicycle but you don't have enough and so jesus pays for the bicycle here your dad does right but that's jesus or president packer's um the mediator the mediator is my favorite talk. Is a classic one i love that talk. uh hey one did you them. enjoy andor Hold on. I was also going to say the mediator <laughs> and the garden. The, I mean, I love the those, crocodile. The, I love those. Talk, not the crocodile. Uh, not the crocodile so much. <laughs> I was going to say the Garden of Gethsemane talk by, um, pres, by I'm just listing my favorite talks. Oh, okay. Um, the mediator by Bert President Packard. Um, the, uh, There's a great seminar video of that when we were in high school. Bruce R. McConkie's last talk. The oh, the, his talk. testimony of Jesus talk. Yeah, that one. And the pride talk by Benson. Oh, that's a great one. Uh, even though it has like, it's fraught. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that we deserved it. And I think we still do. I think, I think that talk is due for resurgence. Like, okay. That's, too, okay. Yeah, this is that's, too much a, that's another, maybe some future. Too, too much inside baseball. Yeah. Um, anyway, have you seen Andor? Did you enjoy it? I loved Andor. Um, new, so the new Star Wars yes. series. So um, the guy who uh, the plays like the pawnbroker, no, the, the antiques merchant, um, Skarsgård oh, yeah. or whatever yeah. his name is, the guy who plays the scientist who isn't Natalie Portman in mm-hmm. the first Thor movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's a great actor, but he sounds exactly like President Packer. <laughs> and once this is, if you have not noticed this, you now will not not be able to notice it. He sounds exactly like President Packer. Okay. That's great. So anyway. That's my fun distraction. Just ruining Star Wars for you, perhaps. Uh, or making it better. Or making it better. I don't know. You'll let me know when season two comes out. Um, so, okay. So, I think this is the LDS perspective. But the argument, what happens is that Protest... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use... Also, well, yes, that's a commonly stated argument. But, I mean, Givens... I've been getting more and more suspicious of that over the last 10 years or so. Okay. And Givens, I think, kind of demolishes it. Like, it just doesn't work. Okay. So, tell me what you mean. Well, I don't even know how to tell you what I mean. Uh, can, can I read you the last paragraph of this article? Yeah. He says, Reclaiming the beauty of Christ's supernal gift may require more frequent employment of the term grace, so central to evangelical discourse, however misappropriately co-opted, meaning... Latter-day Saints are misappropriately co-opting the evangelical term of grace as if we're using it the same way they are. But we shouldn't be. Yeah, with the direction of the co-option. I we're mean, taking more... it from them to try to seem more mainstream, but it's it's not working. Okay. And let's... I know you want to read the rest I of I do thing. want to read the okay, rest, but ahead. you want to interrupt me. So no, that's a... <laughs> I won't. Finish the, finish the thing. Yeah. Whether it will be possible in doing so, to frequent employ the term grace, that is, uh, whether it will be possible in so doing to endow it with a uniquely restorationist set of assumptions and implications is hard to say, and whether, in the effect, we will appear to have ceded inspired doctrinal ground unnecessarily in hopes of broader Christian acceptance will be part of the risk. This is not the real point of the article, but to me, I think it's a really key one. We shouldn't, in our in, in trying to understand a difficult thing, we shouldn't just borrow a prepackaged solution off the shelf from our other christian denominations because we have a lot of interesting and unique things to say about grace and we're at risk in our current moment of assimilation of of losing some of that and forgetting exactly the unique breadth grace can have in our own theology let me oversimplify is the protestant definition of grace such that my own behavior doesn't matter Sometimes. Like, I mean, there's a lot of Protestant interpretations. That's why I'm oversimplifying. I mean, with Calvinists, and I think that's true. If we had a hundred Protestant religions in front of us, some of them would be mad at me when yes. I said that, I assume. Have you ever seen the movie Hail Caesar? Um, n- no. I highly recommend it. Anyway, there's, they're making, it's a, it's a movie about making movies in the 50s, and they're making a biblical epic. A rabbi, a priest, and a minister were all signing off on the same uh, biblical epic, and... Um, 
how are you all supposed to get them to agree about a movie about Jesus? Like, yeah. how? How are you supposed to do that? And essentially the way you do it is by becoming so anodyne and inoffensive that it doesn't say anything. Which is fine for Hollywood, but it's not great for religion. Okay, so, I mean, what I said was overly simple. Let's actually say what Given says okay. is this Protestant thing. And you used it, you said it before, and you used the word substitution, right? Yeah, I, a quote, Christ does not just suffer in our stead, he is judged in our stead, unquote. So, what that means is that um, we won't, according to this Protestant belief, yes. and this is what grace means... Right? Yes. We won't be judged according to ourselves. To ourselves. We are considered righteous because it's Jesus who's being judged in our place. And it is Jesus' righteousness that yes. bridges the gap. It's sort of like we qualified for no, the Olympics. Bridges the gap is the wrong and word. And Carl Lewis runs the race for us and we get the medal because Carl Lewis ran it for us. That's right. Okay. Um, so, again, I'm really worried about oversimplifying here. I know that we have um, some non-LDS people on the, that listen to our show, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, but I guess my point is that that is one of the one of the arguments behind grace. Right. Is, I mean, on the most basic Protestant level, we are depraved and deserving of damnation. Full stop. But in Latter Day Saint theology, we it's there's this bigger idea of being children of gods and having potential of gods and god having come from a similar state we have which demands a different that's just a different set of assumptions and therefore in order to um solve for x like all your variables have different meanings you're going to end come up with a different answer okay well let's hold that thought for a second and let's talk about the other extreme right which is tipping towards works okay yes which um the uh, Pelagians are apparently the only group that ever believed in just works and nothing else. And nobody besides these guys yeah. believed that. I read the Wikipedia every... article on them. They were pretty interesting. Tell me more. Um, well, I printed off their little... Um, so Pelagian, or, or I don't know if his name was Pelagian or if they, they were the Pelagians, whatever. Anyway, this is this is a little, uh, little thing they wrote. It's sort of like a creed, but it's, it's not a creed. He is a Christian who shows compassion to all, who is not at all provoked by wrong done to him, who does not allow the poor to be oppressed in his presence, who helps the wretched, who succors the needy, who mourns with the mourners, who feels another pain as if it were his own, who is moved to tears by the tears of others, whose house is common to all, whose door is closed to no one, whose table no poor man does not know, whose food is offered to all, whose goodness all know, and at whose hands no one experiences injury, who serves God all day and night, who ponders and meditates upon his commandments unceasingly, who is made poor in the eyes of the world so they may become rich before God. And that's what you do. You just live your life that way. It reminds me of a, the hymn, Poor Wayfaring Man of Grief. Yeah, it's like we actually do those things. Mm -hmm. So the statement of we are saved by our works alone, right? Yeah, not very few, if any, Christians truly believe that. Yeah, and certainly not LDS Christians. No. Not that I've ever heard. No, though I have heard people say things as if they believe that. Yeah. I mean, the number of Latter-day Saints I've heard in my life say they will never make it to the social kingdom because they're not good enough suggests that it's all works. Mm -hmm. Nobody's good enough. What, what would we need Jesus for if it were possibly be good enough? Like, it, I, I, and this is not, I mean, this is exactly what we were talking about at the beginning of the episode, but there was a time where we were so focused on works that the role of Christ um, was unclear. And maybe maybe there's will always be a lack of clarity in how these all things balance, but there's no doubt that we can't do this on our own. Look, here's the thing that really got me. Okay, um, Elder James E. Talmadge, right mm -hmm. in his um, book on the Restoration theology, commissioned by the Church, that book did not even include the term grace. It's wild. Okay. And that is a book from, the, that's the Article of Faith, a se Articles of Faith, a series of lectures on the principal doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Right? Well, it's a really important book. I have it over there on my shelf. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things is that 
at the time period where we are avoiding seeming like other Christians, you know, eschewing the cross because we don't want to look like Catholics and doing things like that. I think grace is just one of the things that got caught up in that being different from other Christians. That's not an excuse, but I, I think it's it was part of a larger historical pattern where we didn't want to seem like other Christians in certain ways. I just want to quote a few more parts of this uh, paragraph here from the great, from the Givens article. Obedience is the first law of heaven, proclaims an LDS doctrine manual, citing both scripture and Elder Bruce R. McConkie. And an article of faith is equally emphatic, stating that we are saved mm -hmm. by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. And then this is Givens's little interjection, adding a rather imprecise through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Yes. So and what he's saying is that this imprecise phrase, we are saved through the atonement of Christ by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. That connection there is what oh is imprecise in that article of faith. You know, I just realized the phrasing of that doesn't say who's being obedient. We've always assumed it's us, but maybe it's Jesus. Well, that's an interesting thought. Um, that's not what the article says. I just I had don't... that thought myself. <laughs> I'm not sure I would buy it. I think the article of faith, this is article of faith, uh, the third article of faith, um, it uses the word we. <laughs> we believe that we will be saved yeah. through obedience. Through the, yeah, through obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. And the atonement of Jesus Christ. So if you look at his obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel and the atonement as both being of Christ... Mm -hmm. You could diagram the sentence more than one way. Yeah. <laughs> I just created a new theology, Aaron. <laughs> well, okay, this is why Given says it's a rather imprecise <laughs> It is a little imprecise, yeah, yes. That's good. Well, I'm ready for any new theologies you want to throw by. Okay, so, okay, but here's the point, right? Okay. Grace and works here is this, this contradiction. So, who cares? Well, this isn't an answer to your question, but... Um, so, Matthew Arnold wrote that... St. Paul uses terms like grace in a fluid and passing way, as we might use words, right? When we're talking, we just use words and they mean what we mean them to mean at the moment. This is St. Paul. St. Paul uses grace in this way. He uses it to mean a lot of different things, just sort of, it's just a word he uses. And then theologians, instead of, so this is the sentence I love, because this is, this is, you know, this is, this is us. This is putting us in conflict the, with each other, role, Aaron. In the role of the theologian. Uh, no. No, like, wait till I read the sentence. We are in, we are in conflict because of the sentence. So this okay. is what Matthew Arnold says. Um, so a term which with St. Paul is a literary term, theologians have employed as if they were scientific terms. Mm -hmm. So Paul is being literary and we are treating his literature as if it is a scientific formula. Yeah. So we are applying scientific tools to a literary text and that has resulted in um, theology. Because you can read Paul in both ways, right? You can, okay. but does it matter what he meant? Yes, right. Then I mean, should we read it both ways? I, I don't know. <laughs> this is why, I mean, this is the canonical LDS doctrine of the Book of Mormon, right? Right, yeah. Which is that it nails down what the Bible is trying to tell us in some ways, right? And this quote, and that's why the second Nephi quote is one of the benchmarks of our of the thing that I opened with, right? Yeah. We are saved by by grace after all we can do. Because yeah. here's the problem. Yeah. If you and this is exactly what Given says in his article and I wholly agree with him, right? If you, you t use the substitution art argument yeah. for grace, right? Where Christ is substituted for you. And again, I know this is an over, oversimplification, mm -hmm. and I know that there are Protestants out there who will give me a better answer, right? I have a, sure. I have a really good friend who I know that I can talk to about this, who yeah. listens to our show, all right? Hey, friend. Um, I'll just, uh, um, and I'm, I'll point him at this point in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, that if you accept this substitution argument where Christ is judged for us, yeah. then my actions don't matter, Right. As long as I accept the, the grace of Christ, right, which is a prerequisite. Yeah, maybe. Okay, well, whatever. I mean, this, is the, <laughs> this is the fuzzy It's hard. Part. It's hard to say. But the point is that if I'm not saved based partially on my works, yeah, then my works don't matter, right? Well, and then what is my motivation? 
Well, to, because it's right. Yeah, yeah. This, this is, is kind of what I'm. This is a different at. problem entirely, yeah. right? Like, do we? Um, I forget the name of the Greek guy, but this is a this is a paradox that uh, Socrates posed to a guy, and the paradox is named after the guy. Like, do we do something because it's right, or do something because there's a rule? Yeah. So, Aaron, if there were no rule against driving 95 miles per hour through a kindergarten, no, I wouldn't. Would it. it be okay to do it? It would not be. But there's no rule against it, Aaron. That's right. Yeah. So why aren't you doing it if if we require rules in order to tell us what's right and wrong? And this is this kind of is why I said earlier that it doesn't. That this conversation doesn't matter practically, right? Maybe the problem is our fixation on sin. No, no, no. I was going to say, go in a different direction. Uh Once you accept Christ and you love God, right? And you love your neighbor, right? Then all of this other stuff falls away. It doesn't matter the reasons why and the theology behind it. You just want... Even if, even if this you, is just, but I thought the whole point was we wanted to figure it out. Now oh, I want to figure it out. Figure, yeah, no, we're going to figure it out. Calvinist all of a sudden. I want to figure it out. Is, wait, what does that even mean? Well, I mean, because because uh, to oversimplify Calvinism based on what I learned from studying the Scarlet Letter in high school. Yeah. Um, Calvinists believe you are already saved or damned and what you do doesn't really have anything to do with it. But you want to live as a good person because that reflects that you're a saved person. That's what you want to believe you are. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that about Calvinism. Really, really interesting. Um, I was reading an essay by a friend of ours, a guy in our ward. This is unpublished, so we can't link to it. But he pointed out something really interesting that I hadn't thought of before. In the church, we so often talk about baptism. The purpose of baptism is to redeem you from your sins, to wash away your sins. Um, but probably the scriptures we quote the most about baptism are from Mosiah, where Alma is teaching the people to mourn with those who mourn and, and be a Zion society, right? Like work together, be a people, be a community. Never once in that passage does he talk about redemption of sin. All of that seems to suggest that the purpose of baptism is to make us a community, to make us into Zion. And in the same way, perhaps the atonement is about becoming a community with Christ, being one with him. And if baptism and all the ordinances, all the covenants, um, all of our actions are designed to make us one, to make us Zion, Maybe that's what grace is, and it's less about counting up sins and seeing how many we can wash away, but are we a people? I think it's a great point, um, and it is kind of what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> all you got, well, I mean, all you, you got to do, all you got to do is love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is sufficient motivation, but um, yeah, I'm still not satisfied. This has never satisfied me. Or here's the reason why it's never satisfied me. You are saved by your grace after all you can do, right? Right? I've I love that phrase. Yeah. And it to me it makes sense, and I'm going to try my best and I'm not going to get there, right? Yes. But it kind of implies a line somewhere, right? And I'm nervous about crossing that line, right? Sure. Like how what what's the amount of effort that I need to do to to get there? Well, what if the problem it kind is... Of an, it kind of puts a... It feels like it kind of puts a metric. It's a trick. And it, I worry... And it's something I worry about, It right? feels like we're asking the wrong questions. Because because all the answers we get, no matter how we ask this question, we're ending... All our answers have the same problem. So I have not read this book yet, but uh, Latter-day Saint theologian Adam Miller, who is not featured in this issue of BYU Studies, but he has a new book out called Original Grace, which I haven't purchased yet, but I want to. But I'm going to read a little bit of the promotional materials. Um, so he proposes in this book an experiment in restoration thinking. Um, he suggests that that we have been implicitly affirming the, excuse me, implicitly affirming the traditional logic of original sin. But what if instead of original sin, we emphasize, quote, the deeper reality of God's original grace? What if we broke entirely with the belief that suffering can sometimes be deserved and claim that suffering can never be deserved, unquote? So he's proposing that instead of suggesting that we earn suffering, that suffering is something we get because of our behavior, that that's essentially recreating original sin, and we should be focused instead on grace as the fundamental reality of the universe and not the fall. Now, I haven't read the book, but I think it's a really interesting suggestion and it has the potential to upset a lot of the assumptions we're starting with that are leading to all these difficulties. I found that statement a little confusing because um, of the... Maybe I missed the setup. Um, Catholic person speaking? LDS no, this person? Latter, Latter-day Saint, yeah. 
Okay, so the idea of original sin is not is fairly well, I thought, rejected here in LDS land. Well, y the term is, of course we don't believe in original sin, but we behave as if we do. Just define it really quick. Um, so I'm going to define it here as essentially uh, we have fallen and we come into this world and punishment is absolutely coming our way because we deserve it. Or if we don't deserve it yet, we will deserve it soon. Sure, we get eight years of grace, but then bam, you're a sinner. Yeah. And punishment is yours. And you better hope you get out of it in time. This is kind of why I like this trend that El that our friend here, Terry Givens, is describing of LDS f philosophy, LDS teaching, yeah, trending more towards grace. Yeah. Okay. And um, he quotes Elder Dallin Oaks in 1993. I'll who made, as, as Given says, a remarkable criticism, right? So here's, here's what Elder Oak said. I believe that for a time, and until recently, this was in 93, our public talks and our literature were deficient in the frequency and depth with which they explained and rejoiced in those doctrinal subjects most closely related to the atonement of our Savior. I agree. Okay, going on. A prominent scholar saw this deficiency in our church periodicals published in a 23-year period ending in 1983. I saw this same deficiency when I reviewed the subjects of general conference addresses during the decade ending in the mid-1980s. In other words, what President Oaks is doing is he's reporting on what he thinks is a deficiency in LDS literature in discuss. In 1993, yes, of discussing the atonement of the Savior in conference talks over the last like 20 years or something. And we've gotten a lot better about talking about it, but we haven't all quite figured out what we mean by it. I think is the issue. And that's also what Givens is saying, that we're kind of navigating a theology, yeah, of bringing grace more into our lives, right? Right. Without really, and sometimes we're borrowing ideas from other Christian groups without really considering how well they mesh with our own core theologies. So we end up with occasional contradictions. Look, my understanding of the atonement is something that I cherish. Okay. Okay. And it is very simply that I'm going to work as hard as I can. Yeah. And, um, and Christ will carry me the rest of the way. Right. And um, that mesh of grace and works, to me, has always worked. Right? Yeah. But I recognize that it does place some emphasis on me that I shouldn't think should be placed on the Savior instead. And I... It is a little solipsistic. Oh, you're so good with words! <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, uh, that means um, solipsism is sort of the belief that everything revolves around you. Yeah. Right. Good. Um... So, the, why is this article in here? Because it's an unanswered question. Yeah. I don't think we have an answer And it's an important ourselves. one that I think we need to grapple with. Okay. I asked who cares before. Answer that question. I care. Okay. Um, because, I, so I think about this a lot, and this has sort of become a theme of the podcast, which I didn't realize it would be when we started, but this question of universalism. Yeah. Like, I've become a true universalist, but I'm also afraid of being a universalist. Yeah, um, for good reason, I think. Right, and so trying to, because I don't want to universal, take from, go, like we said yeah. the other day, universalism takes away agency. Yes, right, okay. it's, it's complicated, and I, so I, on the other hand, I don't want to take away from God's power to save us all. Um, that's why, to come back to Adam Miller, I'm going to quote another bit of the pro promotional stuff. Um, he suggests that... Um, the very substance of salvation has always been a grace-filled partnership with Christ. And so instead of grappling over sin and having sin being our core motivation, this idea that grace could be our core motivation and it's something that we can participate in with Christ is a really interesting idea. It's why I want to read the book. I haven't read the book. But I've read other Adam Miller books and I think he's great and really useful in opening up what our faith can mean. Um, but I, I just think that we're not there. Like, we don't understand grace yet. We don't understand it, and I don't understand it. And I'm skeptical that it, there are very many people. And the more confident people are that they understand the relationship between grace and works, the sooner I I become skeptical if they keep talking. <laughs> Here's the thing. We, the, 
I have a sacrament talk. Okay, I've talked with you about this before. Uh -huh. Maybe I haven't. I don't know. I have a pre-prepared sacrament talk on the atonement. Just in case okay? somebody calls it's, on you all of a sudden? It's 30... It's 30 minutes long. Nobody's going to suddenly ask you to speak nope, for 30 minutes. I've told people in the ward. <laughs> oh, I do remember you this. Yes, okay. you're willing to do it, but you need the whole sacrament. I want, I want my 30 minutes where I <laughs> won't give the talk. Yeah. Okay? And I go into all, and I have it all written out in notes. It's one of my favorite topics. It feels, I feel like a deuce, a deuce, <laughs> like an idiot. Maybe we should have a special episode where you just give your talk. Maybe. No, I'll just but, not be there. <laughs> I feel, I feel too weird talking about it, like in those terms. Yeah. It's just, it's only 30 minutes long because, because it's so hard to understand. Yeah. But at the beginning of it, I, I look into the idea of mysteries. Yeah. Okay. And as a church, we kind of fundamentally reject the word mystery. Okay. In the sense that it's used in other religions, meaning that. Um, this we don't understand, and we will never understand it. Yes. Okay? There is one exception. Okay. The atonement. Anytime you read about the atonement, you will read phrases spoken by our prophets who say, through some mechanism, which we do not understand, okay, Yeah. in this life, he paid for our sins and we can be saved, right? Yeah. There's the, the, the idea behind the resurrection, it feels like it's something that I could understand mm -hmm. given enough study, right? Jesus Christ reversed entropy. He was dead. He was not dead. That's amazing. I feel like it's mathematical. Yeah. I feel like I could write that down. I feel like I could do that. Now, in my own limited human we brain, just need the next Einstein to have that breakthrough about I, how to reverse I, entropy. I feel like that's the case, and that might be hubris that's talking, mm -hmm. right? But the atonement, I think, is different, mm -hmm. and I think it is it is different in because we've been told it's different. That yeah. this aspect of our religion is mysterious. Okay, and. Personally, I think part of that has to do with the concept of an of infinity, mm -hmm. right? And how it's well, an infinite. Right into our next topic, but oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, the fact <laughs> yeah, finish, Christ, finish, finish, finish. Well, the fact that Christ's atonement was an infinite atonement. Yeah. Right. Which, which is, is already a concept we're not good at understanding. Right, and I I wonder if that's not one of the reasons why our leaders talk about the atonement this way. I don't know that mm -hmm. it is. There might be something more fundamental behind it, but. Um, but the fact that Christ's atonement is an infinite atonement and it has to be an infinite atonement because you, if like the Book of Mormon says, you, um, you could, if you stole, you could pay it back. But if mm -hmm. you kill, you can't, right? There is this fundamental chasm between what I've done and what I could possibly be forgiven for that can only be bridged by the an infinite atonement because yeah. only that infinite suffering accounts for like or can let people like who are associated with the sin like forgive me for it right not yeah. for my sake i mean it's bigger than for, mortality but for, that much is sure yeah not for his sake but for mine forgive yeah. this person right and so that's that's a quick summary of my atonement of my atonement um thoughts um so i really enjoy talking about this this has always been one of my favorite subjects because, and it might be just my own perversity, anytime <laughs> you say the word, I cannot understand this, and I won't understand this, mm -hmm. I immediately fixate on that, and I'm like, well, what do you, what do you possibly mean? Well, that's, that's where um, papers in nature come from. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have another topic. Uh, I have notes. Well, you said written... that the infinity thing connected it. To right. Because uh, we're talking about on the foreknowledge of God and what does time look like to God. Okay. And among my notes, I see um, written in the margins, I see chaos theory. Uh -huh. I see metaverse. Uh -huh. I see solution and epigraph. None of these themes really seem connected to each other, but it does suggest that there's a lot going on here. Okay. So I feel like we're kind of, we are, I do feel like we're kind of changing subjects. We are changing subjects, but I do feel they're really closely related because as you were just saying, 
the nature of the atonement is not quite understandable. Yeah. And probably part of the reason it's not understandable is because the atonement in some way has twisted time and reality on itself to change the nature of ourselves and the nature of our potential and the nature of what is possible. He's changed us from whatever we were into whatever we can be. The atonement does that. And that, that, that warping of space and time, whatever is happening, is related to God's ability to know everything, whatever that means. And, you know, so I, I think they are connected. It's interesting. I Part of me bounces off that way phrasing that you use well i'm not sure it's right because space, space and time the whole thing we've been talking about is how we don't understand it so that's yeah. that's fine but but what's clear is a lot of the topics we've been talking about this season about agency for instance are connected to this question of time right so does the atonement mean that we are sinners and then we are saved or does it mean that if we are ever going to be saved we were always saved does it mean we're always saved unless we reject that like we don't really know okay well i do think this is the best connective um, material between these two topics mm-hmm. is the topic of agency, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because um, if God knows what you're going to do tomorrow, do you have the power to decide that yourself? Yeah, right. And the whole universalism concept, I think, drives from this as as well. Um, why don't you, can you summarize the, I, the remember how we've talked about <sighs> how in every chapter there's a yes or no question, right? Oh, okay. What is um, the yes or no question of this talk? I guess on I the would foreknowledge say, of God? does God's foreknowledge, whatever that means, uh-huh. does that uh, take away from our agency? Yeah, I actually feel like three specific hypotheses are presented here. Okay, in this work. Okay, the first is God knows everything, and that includes the entire future. Right. Yeah. And the position of every quark at every moment. At every moment, right? And so the problem, and then there's an immediate philosophical problem, which is yeah. no, nothing I do matters. Because right. he's he set up the universe as... Um, it's the clockwork. It's the perfect... He set up the Clock universe maker. perfectly, yeah. right? So this is my best self. This is a very traditional <laughs> Christian problem, right? Because if God created the universe out of nothing then everything in the universe is the way God created it, and it is going the way he wished it to, and therefore, we, this is where we bump into the problem of evil and everything else, because God made it this way, therefore it is this way, therefore why are people mean to each other? Yeah, right. Now, we as Latter-day Saints have a um, get-out-of-jail-free card for this one, because we don't believe in ex nihilo creation. God created stuff from pre-existing matter. We are created from pre-existing intelligences. So, so that specific problem doesn't exist, but if God knows everything then in a very core way, the problem hasn't changed. Okay, so good. I like that, the statement. Omniscience. Yes. Right? And omnipotence. Omnipotence. Yes. My favorite potence. This is our... our <laughs> okay, so let's swing the pen- pendulum all the way in the other direction, right? Yeah. Which is that God doesn't know the future. He's just as surprised as we are. Okay, so there are specific statements in here from church leaders about God not knowing the future. Shall we read some of them? Uh, sure. Can I share mine first? Yeah. So as a child theologian, I came up with something pretty similar to what Elder Talmadge is going to say, because uh, this problem was obvious to me, even as a youth. And I decided the solution was God doesn't know what's going to happen, but God has a perfect sense of probability and therefore can predict with incredible accuracy what will happen, but without telling us or, or knowing or forcing us to behave in a certain way. This is the intermediate definition. Yeah. Okay. And this is, as uh, as Welch says, um, Talmadge's argument for God's probabilistic inductive foreknowledge has not endured as a rigorous theological reckoning. So thanks a lot. Me and Talmadge <laughs> will take that hit, I guess. But I think she's right. Like, it doesn't really solve any problems. Well, let's, okay. Let's talk about the extremes first. Okay. The one extreme we just mentioned, right, which is... Um, God knows the entire future. Yeah. Right? And is omnipotent. Yeah. Therefore, like I said before, this is my best self. All right? Yeah. What you see is what you get. Yeah. Okay? And I'm... And so... And it's terrible because it completely takes agency away. hmm This This I 100% agree. Cannot... Like the whole idea of a probable... Like a deterministic universe. It's, yeah. Right? Where the end is known from the beginning is kind of anathema to my own happiness. <laughs> right. And it just doesn't match with the Joseph Smith theology. 
And I'm going to hold that thought. Okay. I want to ask why you say that, but let's not answer that now. I want to talk about okay. what the other extreme Other is, extreme. Which I said before, God doesn't know the future. Okay? And now I need to find the, the quote where someone really disagrees with that. So this comes from Parley P. Pratt and Orson Pratt. Oh, yes. Our, our over God people from a previous episode. We love these guys. Um, and by the way, if you don't know church ha- history, the Pratt's have just this really special place in our hearts, specifically Parley, because his story about his conversion from the Book of Mormon, it's one of the most commonly repeated and one of the most powerful examples of the yeah, book. Yeah, his, if read you read haven't the, read it, his autobiography, especially the first half, one, the first half is excellent. It's like some of the best literature in our tradition. Yeah, he read the Book of Mormon, it converted him. And yep. it, it, uh, he went from zero to zero to hero as yeah. <laughs> in like a few days. Um, so, okay, but his argument was, quoting Welsh, for their parts, the Pratts argued in a theological vein that while the person of God the Father may act within the dynamic flow of time, subject to the conditions of space-time, God quo Godhood, okay? <laughs> this is why I love Welsh, yeah. okay? So, it's so dense, Okay. <laughs> God, quo, Godhood possesses absolute omniscience, okay? In other words, God cannot forget, and this is according to the Pratts, God cannot progress in knowledge or learn everything which he did not previously know. God knows all future events, including contingent acts of free agents. Okay, so that's the statement. This is the Green Lantern theory of Godhood. Wow, what does that mean? Well, you know, are you familiar with the Green Lantern? I love the Green Lantern, but I wouldn't call myself... Okay. An aficionado. So they have those power rings, right, that they sure. use. And, and they have to recharge them uh, using the Green Lantern itself. And then that gives them power. So so uh, we had a previous episode. I forget which one it is. If you don't remember, I'm sure you'll figure it out in the show, show notes. But where Orson is talking about this um, over-God idea, where God is God, but he's tapping into the over-God, which makes him God or something. So it's kind of the same idea. Like, God can do everything and knows everything, but it's because he's tapping into this, like, non-personal godness that fills the universe and it's his ability to access that that makes him god so cool not at all except that lds tradition. also i think he's wrong <laughs> personally also like like re- i was actually really glad to revisit this because having read it before and then bumping into it again i'm like yeah i don't think this is right okay. <laughs> it's a really interesting idea and theologically it offers a lot of interesting possibilities but ultimately it just doesn't sit with me Brigham Young also did not agree with the Pratt. Well, he didn't get along with them about just about anything. So <laughs> uh, That sounds like there's more history there that I'd love to know about. Okay. Okay. So here's what Brigham Young said. According to the Pratt's theory, Orson Pratt's theory, God can progress no further in knowledge and power. But the God that I serve is progressing eternally, and so are his children. They will progress to all eternity if they are faithful. Yeah. So continuing to was, quote. Oh, Welsh. The, right. It was in the it was in the episode on eternal progression. Okay, perfect. That was the episode. So continuing to quote Welsh, Young seems to construe eternity as a chronological sequence of endless duration, wherein the past closes and recedes, while the future remains unformed and invisible. At any given moment, only present events actually exists. That God would remain. Oh boy epistemically immutable (laughs) in the midst of this temporal dynamic temporal cosmos was for young not the stable ground of reality that it represented for classical theism but an enervating restriction of divine potential okay yeah meaning that he just rejected it right he said that this is actually a restriction on god yeah she cut it off but Immediately after that, Brigham Young famously said, and Orson's a dummy, you can tell him I said so. But it says that? No. Yeah, that, that, you can look it up in the Journal of Discourse. It totally says that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this this gets to... So, just restating oh, it. Yes. That means, the, in summary, either the God knows the future or God doesn't know right. the future. Right? Right? Yeah. Okay. So, I, I also want to thank this article for clearing up to me that... Blake Ostler and Blair Ostler are two different Latter-day Saint theologians. Oh, interesting. Um, so Blake Ostler is the one we're going to talk about here in a second. Okay. Blair Ostler wrote uh, Queer Mormon Theology, okay. which is a cool little book. Uh, and they're not the same person. Anyway, uh, Blake 
comes up with what seems like a pretty good solution to the problem, which is that... Sorry, that's the astronaut question. Which way it is it? Okay. Right. So, so now Blake... So, so Blake um, says that God can see the multiverse branching in every direction. Yeah. And he has a contingency plan for every possibility, but he doesn't know which one's going to happen. So he doesn't know tomorrow what you're going to do, but he knows all the things you could do, and he's prepared for all of them. So which this, is a pretty interesting solution. Like, I find it pretty satisfying intellectually. It sounds a lot like the Talmud argument they derived yes, from earlier. Yes, except for is, it doesn't take away, it doesn't suggest there's only one possibility. Oh. Because all the possibilities are open. God really doesn't know which one's going to happen, but he's ready for all of them. Okay. That's now, how he can know everything, and yet we can still have a choice without him knowing what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you two reasons why I really like this. Okay. Okay. The first is that um, I am a computer scientist turned structural biologist, right? Yes. Turned statistician. Okay. So <laughs> turned I turned grant writer. Turned grant writer, which is all <laughs> I'm doing lately. What I mean by that is that as I moved from the bench, from the from the from you know heating things up and cooling things yeah. down as a biologist, I and into computer science and into the mathematics of diffraction. Yeah. One of the things I had to learn was probabilistic statistics. Okay. I want to talk more about that. Bayes' theorem. Okay. Where I don't know the, I have some estimates as to what I think the probability should be. Yeah. Right. And now I'm going to refine some parameters that until my probability of an, of something is maximized. Yeah. Right. And therefore that will best explain reality. This whole probabilistic approach to determining what is happening within a system yeah. that you can't directly observe, right? It's really interesting. And to see that reflected in theology is satisfying to me. Yeah. Okay? But there's another reason. And that is the mechanism of cell cellular gradients, right? I don't know what that means. Okay, let me tell you. So within the cells, you have pathways. Mm -hmm. and the pathways are a bunch of things that get triggered, right? Neurons are sure. the best example. Okay. Okay, so a neuron fires or it doesn't fires, and it sends an electrical signal. Which makes the impulse, next one fire right? or not fire. And it's fire. a very binary thing. Okay. But what's happening under the scenes are gradients. So it's not a question of... Our digital cells have an analog underpinning. They do. It's not a question of if on or off to fire it, right? It builds up. Um, chemicals until something happens, some kind of yeah. concerted threshold can happen, right? And so the, un the and this is the chaos theory I think that you probably wrote in your margins. Yeah, you're, you're. I think you're getting real close to it. Yeah, which is that um, the, there's the probable. It's not, it's not just the statistics, but it's actually the reality under the hood. There's is a series of gradients. Reality is a series of, of gradients. Yeah, right. Is one way to describe cellular biology. Okay. I, and I think that you could you could say that and have a lot of evidence that that's the case. Sure. Based on my understanding. Yeah. Um, can I make a statement that will lead into a question? Yeah. So one of the problems with God is we cannot understand God. Yeah. And therefore, we use whatever metaphors we have available to us in our own lives to explain God. Would you agree with that so far? Sure. So we use different metaphors than Martin Luther would have because the well, time has passed. We use the bicycle as you described before. Right. Yeah. Um, and and can't pay for. And now we're talking about bicycle. cellular gradients, which is not a metaphor. I'm pretty sure Martin Luther ever used. Yeah, that's true. So, um, so I love yeah. that because it opens up possibilities and it helps us bring God into our own lives. And I, I think that this, these literary tools, these theological tools, are super useful and accurate and good. Um, however, it also runs the risk of us recreating God in our own image. Mm -hmm. So um, I assume in your work you have to deal with quantum effects because you're working with tiny things. Okay, so yes, this is what's happening under the hood is quantum. I actually am one step above it. In, okay. In, in protein crystal. So it doesn't worry you too much. Those electrons, you can. It's okay. However, I'm close to it. There's a field that I'm starting to get interested in called quantum crystallography. Oh, that, that sounds fun. <laughs> sounds, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let me let me tell you where I'm going with this. Uh, the thing about the quantum realm is it is definitionally ununderstandable and the very little like i am not an expert by any stretch um not close uh i am just a 
I am a person who can read intelligent books, but I, you know, I'm not like a scientist. I think we can be more precise as to what you're saying. It's yeah. not that it's not understandable. I can write an equation that describes it. Sure. Okay. But that equation, I can't relate to my own life and give it any meaning. No, that's not quite what I mean. What I mean okay. is like, like I'm talking about the sort of thing where like if you measure something yeah. and it's either a particle or a wave, that sort of problem. Yeah. I think you could like, write an equation that describes right, that behavior. You can describe it, but ultimately by the more you know about something, the more you limit it, what it can be. Mm -hmm. And that inherently makes it not true. Like, I think it is, would you agree that it's more true to say that a proton or is or not a photon, a photon is a particle and a wave. Okay. But as soon as we look at it, it becomes an ore. Yeah. Would that be fair to say? I think you're right. But again, I'm not a quantum mechanist. Mechanicist. Right. And it honestly it doesn't matter if we're right or wrong. That's okay. That doesn't get to my point. Um, my point is that uh, the more we understand about reality, the more we understand how much there is to know and how impossible it is to know. And I'm happy to be a man of faith. But at the same time, the more I understand this stuff, the more I question that omnipotence is a meaningful term and is even useful. Like, what does it mean for... How could God know? And again, maybe this is a lack of my own capacity for faith, but how can God know both that where each photon is both as a wave and a particle simultaneously like like it seems like the more we understand about reality the more we understand that it's not understandable now again this could be me failing to see how god um fits into the reality as we understand it in our current yeah. moment of time and it but kinda... i think it raises interesting questions related to all this stuff like what does it mean for god to know everything and does it require knowing everything because the idea, it's, it's sort of like the map. The only map that can be perfectly accurate is as big as reality. Mm -hmm. And the only computer that can calculate the position of everything in the universe is, is the universe. Um, and so unless we want God to be a diffuse thing, like if we want God to be the way we understand him, then again, this could be my, just a lack of understanding, right? A lack of faith. But it seems to me that instead of just saying God's omniscient, it would be fruitful to consider what does it mean when we say omniscient? Uh, because it might not mean literally omniscient because that's an absurd thing to say. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And there's something about what you're saying that could be argued is limiting God. Well, it, it absolutely is. And that's why possibly it is um, heretical for me to say such a thing or blasphemous. But I, I think it's a useful question to ask ourselves. Like, are we asking God to be something that God is not interested in being? And and if so, are we are we looking beyond the mark by insisting that God knows where every photon is? God the Father yes. is the supreme being in whom we believe. <laughs> okay? I'm quoting LDS.org under the gospel topic. Okay? Yeah. The God our Father. Okay? God the Father. Yeah. Okay? In whom we believe, whom we worship, and to whom we pray. He is the ultimate creator, ruler, and preserver of all things. He is perfect, has all power, and knows all things. Whatever that means. He has a body of flesh and bones... <laughs> As tangible as man. Yes. Okay. I just, I, 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 look, I kind of, this is where I want to go too. Yeah. With Heavenly Father. I mean, it has to be okay that we don't know everything. Yeah. But I, you can only have faith in something that's true. Yeah. But here's what it says. Okay. <laughs> he is perfect, has all power, and knows all things. Okay. But what is included in all things? Well, the word all. Yeah, I don't know. And the weird thing. Does it? I mean, this is sort of like... Okay, I'm being a bit... I'm, yeah, I know I'm you being, are. I know I'm, you are. Um, it's just like, it's it's a really big question. And I worry that if we insist... Like, this is the problem with the whole question, right? Um, there's... Uh, I'm, I'm going to... One line from Welch's article. Acknowledging the diversity of LDS positions on the topic. That's not even a full sentence. There's a diversity of LDS positions on the topic. There's room for debate and discussion and, and a lack of understanding. Um, I just, like a lot of things, if we don't understand something, we should be okay with admitting that. And so the specific example that I gave why I personally, um, am a little, uh, jumpy about omniscience, like that doesn't mean anybody else should agree with me or say, oh, that's a good point, Jepson. Good for you. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is like, it's okay for us not to know things and whatever reason we personally don't know something, that's okay. Um, that's where faith comes in. That's where grace comes in. Uh, but ultimately, the world's a lot complicated that we are not God. We can't understand all this stuff. So faith ultimately is more important than understanding. And so while you were saying how, like, when we can't understand stuff, that's that's a draw to think about it. Sure. I'm fine with that. This podcast wouldn't exist otherwise. Yeah. But reaching conclusions, I think, um, might even be counterproductive in this case. 
It, I, 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 I kind of agree with you. The whole point of this issue is there are open questions. Yes. Right? Um, and I just want to restate the, the dissonance. The dissonance of if God does know all things, as it says here, yeah. right? That means he knows the future forever. If all things includes the future forever. Yeah. <laughs> if. And then my and then I don't have agency. Right? That's a problem. Yeah. Right? Though so there's a there's two separate if clauses in there. Yeah. Both of which may not reflect reality. But the conclusion of that but they both seem to seem to follow. Like there's a logic to that. Right. right? God is God knows all things, therefore he knows the future, therefore I have no agency. Right? Those yes. three things seem to follow. They also wow. seem to directly contradict other parts of our doctrine, which include that we have agency, and then that was the whole point of the plan. Yeah. Um, there's a really great, and this is going to tie our two chapters together. This is a quote from Walter Benjamin, whoever he is. But um, this idea that every moment, uh, quote, this is every moment is you know or could be at least quote the small door through which the messiah enters unquote so um there's this idea and the dnc talks about this right like there's an there's an a moment that never lasting now like a, an eternal now i think is the phrase i should look it up but god lives in the eternal now whatever that means so he doesn't live in chronological linear time in the same way we do and somehow that doesn't take away from our agency I don't know what that means or how that works, but somehow Jesus being Jesus and the atonement being the atonement takes a lot of these questions out of chronological time and moves them into some sort of eternity. There's there's the line I quoted a bunch of times in previous episodes where um, Jesus is like playing a prank on everybody uh, from the Doctrine and Covenants. Like, oh, I said eternal hell. That's because it's my hell and my name's eternal, <laughs> but it's not doesn't mean it's going to last forever. Wink, wink. I think there's something similar going on here. Like it's useful for us to believe and to know that God knows all things, but maybe all things are because my name's all right. Like uh, mm. there's something similar going on here where it's like, look, you dummies don't expect to understand this. It's fine that you'd understand this. I know everything. It's going to be okay. Just trust me, Accept the atonement. And it's, and someday because we believe in this eternal progression idea, you'll understand. But right now that's not the point. I love that summary. I think it's the perfect way to end the show, to be honest. Um, look, dummies, I gotcha. <laughs> it's a perfect way to end the show. Uh, do you have any other points, So I uh, did find the DNC scripture there. Oh, do, do you, should, want, to do you want to read it? it? Yeah, this, why don't you read it? And then there's is, one more thing I want to mention from Rosalind's article, and then we'll stop. Okay, so DNC 130 verse 7, I think, is the one that you're referring to. Let's hear it. But they reside in the presence of God on a globe like the sea of glass and fire where all things for their glory are manifest, past, present, and future, and are continually before the Lord. There's, um, you know who Kip Thorne is, the Kip. physicist? Did you know he has a Berkeley Ward connection? No. He went to grade school with a member of our ward. Okay. Um, anyway, Kip Thorne, a uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, spent a lot of time thinking about multidimensionality. And if I can find this in a Wired article, it, it was about the movie Interstellar, which he helped them build the black hole in that movie. But um, he said something like, I've spent my whole life thinking about dimensions above the third right, and there's like five minutes where I understood it, and then I lost it. <laughs> and he is he's a brilliant genius, and these things are just hard to understand, and that's okay. Um, Rosalind Welch suggests that the four axes that structure the issue of God's foreknowledge and our agency are time, knowledge, reality, and agency. We're already four dimensions. We can't totally understand that. Okay, wait, just say, Time. This, say this again. This is Rosalind's quote. Right, she says there are four axes. Well, Welsh's on which, quote. Right, these are the four axes on which we need to um, place our understanding. There's time, mm -hmm. knowledge, reality, and agency. And all four of those things need to be respected. But how do they all fit together? It's, it's hard to say. In other words, the congruence of what is actually happening to our souls yes. okay, exists somewhere. In a way that doesn't violate time, mm -hmm. right? Either is in, but is either in it or above it somehow. Right. Right. Doesn't violate the reality, the measurements that we can make. Yes. Doesn't violate our agency, our Which ability is core. to choose right and wrong. 
and doesn't well this is actually you're just quoting from the title of the talk right right she yes yeah, she puts it right in the title of her article and doesn't va violate knowledge i think that's referring well, to god's knowledge specifically god's omniscience yes so um wow what a really cool way to encapsulate this yeah. problem whatever the answer is mm -hmm. right it threads this four-dimensional line mm -hmm. of um being true um, in an understanding of time, omniscience, or, or knowledge, actual reality that can measure, and the agency of yeah. um, humans. Well, Aaron. Yeah. If you could hide to cold <laughs> in the twinkling of an eye. Yes. <laughs> and then continue onward. Uh -huh. Just forget it. Like, it's too much. You can't understand it. It's big. Um, With that same speed to fly, do you think that you would ever... Through yeah. all eternity, find out the Where, what? Find I out don't know. The, Where gods began to be, or something. Gods began to be. That's that's in there somewhere. That doesn't rhyme, so that must be the wrong line. But <laughs> um, I guess I guess what I'm saying is, the universe is big. This is something we know scientifically as well as theologically, mm -hmm. and maybe quoting Douglas Adams. Yeah, is really, <laughs> is really big. That's right. Um, one of my favorite theologians. Um, but. Ultimately, maybe we can just be grateful that we know we have a guide in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And we don't necessarily know, need to know how his grace is functioning or exactly what he knows. We can just trust that he loves us and he has what's best in mind for us and he's pretty on top of things. Um, the, and, atone, the atonement works. Yeah. Heavenly grace parents works. put us here. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it is. What if you don't mind me quoting that book? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I do not think grace is a petroleum product, but it does work just fine. Um, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> We're a proud member of the Dialogue Podcasting Network. We sure are. Yeah. Um, oh, hey, the latest issue of Dialogue has a review I wrote about three a new comics about Joseph Smith. Ah, you, so. we mentioned this on the oh, show Oh, did we mention before. that last time? Okay. Yeah, on it's the show been out in, for a while. Few, in a few episodes. Oh, okay. So, yeah, now it's out. Um, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Sure. Um, please follow, you know, Eric's works. Um, uh, I wanted to call out the discord server. Um, our last episode on war was really fun one to record. It was heavy in some ways, as we discussed on the show, but it also didn't have everything that I was really trying to communicate. And so I put a lot of my additional thoughts on the discord yeah. server. Join the server. So if you want to follow along with what that discussion was we had a lot of discussion over there um and we'll put the then, link to the server in the notes yeah and, we'll, and by we i mean aaron yes <laughs> <laughs> i'd like to thank um daniel foster smith for our uh, for our audio for our music and aaron um, for the sun chips which got me through this <laughs> all right thanks Eric. thank you bye bye